All right, welcome back everyone. Sean Brewster, Biting Lennon here once again today. Today's topic is a big one, Bo. We can go on for this about this for hours, I think, but we're not gonna, we're gonna try to keep it tight. But the topic today is posture. This is one that's gonna upset a few people, I'm sure. And that's not our goal today. The goal today is to talk about this from a modern uh, and evidence-based and informed perspective and try to perhaps throw away or dispel some of these long held and unfounded beliefs around posture and what we do as clinicians, right? This is a, it's a tricky topic. Yeah, it's, it's one of the first things that we all learn in our undergraduate programs. And there's been such a heavy emphasis on postural assessment and alignment and misalignment and, you know, mechanical focus. Um, and, you know, when someone presents with pain, sort of having that cause and effect relationship, well, it's, it's due to this postural problem, um, which is, which is interesting when we think there's, there's no, there's no real, um, causal evidence to suggest that, that, um, posture is linked with pain. Yeah. And, and often I think that, um, you're right. You know, we look for that, that the confirmation of our theory, you know, someone will present with, they've got one shoulder rolled forward and they're getting tingling down their arm. So we assume that, well, okay, well, because of that posture, there's a structure in the front of the shoulder dragging you forward, that's compressing the nerve. Hey, presto, you've got nerve pain. But there's, we know that there's a thousand possible causes for that. And that shoulder posture may have predated the, the nerve pain they're experiencing. So you can't always relate the two. But I think if we kind of zoom out for a second, looking at posture, we've also got to consider it from a gross and a local anatomy perspective. You know, we've got the the long held or the old school chiro and osteo beliefs around um, structures being needing to be uh, perfectly aligned for there to be health, you know, and that's, I don't know that that's not the way that those, those practices are necessarily taught today, but originally it was, if that bone's out of position, you're going to be painful. You're going to be unhealthy. You're going to have dysfunction of some sort. And so there's the, the local structural uh, alignment posture we're talking about, but also the gross anatomy of the shoulders forward, the pelvis is tilted, one leg's longer than the other. And so we're, I guess we've got to consider both sides of that story as well. Yeah, and the pelvic example is a, is a great example. You know, so many people um, will correlate a, an anterior pelvic tilt with low back pain or an excessive lumbar lordosis. And, um, you know, that again, cause and effect relationship that if you've got a, an anterior tilt, well, that's the reason for your back pain. Or... If you've got an anterior tilt, you will eventually get back pain unless you don't get out of it. So you can see how that is setting the patient up for, for um, fear and anxiety that potentially they're going to have pain one day or, you know, that it can be quite disempowering as well. If someone's presenting with back pain and, oh, it's because of your anterior tilt and sort of, oh, how do I fix that? If they can't fix it, then... Um, it can be quite frustrating and, and um, you know, leave them feeling helpless, uh, you know, and, and what's really quite interesting about the, the pelvic tilt um, is an interesting paper looking at 30 different pelvises and the, the morphological variation of the ASIS and PSIS um, varied between zero and 23 degrees. So, you know, we've got a consider that is there is there some form of bony morphological variation or is it a true soft tissue ligamentous structures that are, that are um, you know putting it in that position yep. so you know simply by just lining up those two structures those two bony landmarks and going you've got an anterior tilt that's your cause of the pain that's it's very simplistic and one-dimensional yeah you can't just look at the posture as an isolated piece of information as a clue and say, well, that's the only clue I need, right? And your example there of, you know, the different degrees of, of angle from one pelvis to another, it's like no two sides of a human face are identical. You look at someone's face, it looks the same left or right. But if you put a mirror up there and you look at one side by itself, it's, it's a completely different face. So the human body's the same, you know, the one scapulothoracic region for, versus the other is gonna be different. One side of the pelvis would be different. One leg is often longer or shorter than the other and it doesn't have to necessarily equal pain and i think that it's it's so easy for us as clinicians to go right you've got problem with your back you've got a sore back let's look at something i can measure all right let's measure your leg length let's measure your asis versus psis let's measure left asis versus right i found something there you go i found something that must be the source of your pain 
but one isolated piece of information by itself does not give you an answer. Yeah, how do we know that they weren't in that in that position for years and years and then exactly. something happened for whatever reason of various different factors and influences and then everything's been now blamed on on that um, you know minor indiscrepancy in in symmetry. So you know, yeah, we, we can't just put it all down to that because even on the same side, you know, if you've got two hemipelvis, one side can be different to the other as far as the morphology, but it doesn't mean that they've got a torsion. And then if all of the treatments and, and emphasis is, is around to getting, getting them back to structural alignment and perfect symmetry, um, you know, that can be a long process of no real change. And then it, the influence on the psychological aspect of um, then I'm out of alignment, my structurally unstable, um, you know, this can really exacerbate symptoms and, and heighten someone's pain experience. Yeah. And I think the human body was never designed to be perfectly symmetrical. Well, I don't think that I know that, right. It's just yeah. a fact. And you can see that in, I've seen so many clients, um, particularly athletes who have come to me with uh, a lower limb or a lower back kind of issue. And they present with, an orthotic in one shoe to either correct a biomechanical fault or to correct a leg length discrepancy in one in one leg and they'll come in complaining of this problem they've had for a long time and they'll say i, I have this lift in my shoe and it makes all the difference without that i have pain i said well have you tried not having that in your shoe and they said no, no no i haven't taken it out for years but you still have pain okay let's try take it out and they take it out and then within a week or so their pain is gone so the human body's got this amazing ability to adapt to asymmetries. You might be born with a leg that's a centimetre or two longer than the other, and you've had 10, 20, 30, 40, however many years you are, old you are, to change. And then suddenly someone comes and whacks an orthotic in one shoe to try to correct that, to fix your isolated pain um, incident, your low back pain, because they connected a leg length with a back problem. And now you've just created uh, an, a reverse adaptation to the adaptation. And so you're having to undo something that your body has tried to overcome for 30 or 40 years. And again, it's about taking one clue, one piece of information and assuming that that's all there is to it. We can't do that. Yeah, that's right. We can't just say that that, that is the cause of the pain or that is going to cause you pain um, without zooming out and looking at the other factors that, that may be associated. You know, if you look at, for example, someone who um, may have, depression, anxiety, they may be in more of a stooped posture and you look at their thoracic spine, their forward head posture, their medially rotated shoulders and you say, well, well it's, because of, it's because of your posture is why you've got this pain. But we know that there's a very close association with um, de depression, mood-related disorders, emotional-related disorders and pain. Uh, so people with depression, anxiety, are more likely to have uh, an increase in in um, in symptoms or pain, uh, and you know people in chronic pain are more likely to have depression. So when we look at it like that, if you think, well, maybe these other psychological, social, environmental factors could be leading to that pain experience, or you know contributing to it. But then if you just take out, well, we've got to get that shoulder back, and that's that's the focus but then you know whatever you do and you, you get that shoulder back into a position that is symmetrically ideal um, but the pain's still there because we haven't addressed all of these other factors um, the psychological influence that that's really contributing to those symptoms it's not just a physical thing is it no, you're right. yeah so let's challenge this then what if what about the patient that comes to you and says okay um, my back's typically fine but when I, uh, I go and work um, and I wear a shoe with a little bit of a heel in it, I notice that my back gets very sore. And somebody once told me it's because the, the heel lifts up and my pelvis tips forward, my center of gravity is there and it puts my back into a bit more of an arch and that gives me back pain. And I see that happening every time I'm in that posture. So how could the posture not relate to the pain if that's the case? Yeah, well, that could be some form of a, a mechanical change. It's like doing an activity that you're not quite used to. You know, it's a conditioning process to, to get there. Um, so, you know, when you look at things like that, then, yeah, there can be that mechanical component to it. Um, but I think, you know, if, that's quite a simple one. You take away the, the shoe and then if the symptoms go away, then, then that's fine. But 
then when you look at someone who um, they get their pain every day at, at work, sitting or standing, whatever that may be. And we, if we just directly related a mechanical cause to that, what's their job satisfaction? You know, do they have any, um, you know, any financial implications? Do they um, really want to be there? Do they have other things going? Are they in a high stressed work environment? Um, but then they start to get low back pain while they're standing. And that's quite simple to draw those two together without addressing, you know, the level of stress, mood, job satisfaction, financial implications, what's happening in their, their social life, what's happening at home, all of these other factors, a multitude of things that can contribute. And then it's just labeled to the mechanical source. Yeah. Um, so what you're saying then, tell me if, you, if I've got this right, if the patient presents with uh, a trigger that is, um, uh, momentary in time so like the shoe example with the heel um, or somebody who sits in a certain posture at work that is awkward if like they're sharp holding a, a phone on one shoulder where they're while they're um, talking and typing for example if we can connect a single moment in time that would that creates an obvious overload mechanically of tissues and that perfectly relates to their pain then that correlation with posture is okay yeah yeah, for sure. I mean, you think about if 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 I'm sitting in in one specific position and I've been told to keep my upright posture and my pelvic pelvis in a certain spot, and then you know, and I'm not used to that, and then after a few hours, I'm just like, oh, my back is sore. Um, so rather than being told to stand in one specific position, or if we've got something that's wedging us into a certain spot that we're not used to, they're not that we're not conditioned to, it should be more of a matter of, well, sit however you're comfortable. If anyone's ever seen me sitting, I'm sitting in the most slumped posture, but that's comfortable for me. But then I'll change it. I'll sit upright for a while and then I'll, you know, shift off to the side, you know, changing all of these different postures. And, um, you know, I spend a lot of the time at, at the desk now and I don't get any pain. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of about just adjusting uh, different movements and positions and not being focused on one specific perfect posture yeah. but if you are if if there is a certain position that's causing symptoms it's we need to educate the patient out of that um, but also condition them to that movement and that's not just from changing a posture it could be promoting exercise um, you know general well-being that can all help to to dampen someone's pain um, and, and improve tissue health. Yeah, and I think that the tell um, on whether or not posture is truly a component of their pain is, you know, for example, the, the forward, the forward um, shoulder posture, the upper cross, classic upper cross posture, increased kyphosis, rounded shoulders, protracted scapula, that kind of classic posture that we, we all point to and go, well, that's the source of your upper back pain. That's the source of your nerve pain in your arm. That's the source of your neck pain, whatever it might be. If they have that pain constantly, well, then drawing it out that pointing to that posture and kind of going, well, that's the cause, maybe. But really, does someone have pain like that all the time? It'll be at certain times when they're doing certain activities. And so if the posture is truly the cause, well, you, you would assume that the pain should be there all the time. It's like arthritis sufferers. People think that once you've got arthritis, you're going to have joint pain all the time. But we know that that's not true. They have pain at certain times. So how could it possibly be only the arthritis causing that pain? There's other factors at play. If we can control those other factors, we can potentially help control that pain. Yeah, and pain's a sensory and emotional experience. So we can't just look at the sensory aspect of it. We've got to understand what else is going on. Um, you know, emotions influence behaviours and beliefs and, you know, the, the, list, the list goes on. So um, there's certainly different uh, aspects and components that we need to consider. Yeah. So that's our, that's our zoomed out view of posture. Let's zoom in now. Let's go to that local uh, structural postural approach that we we're talking about before where you, you know, the old school osteochiro, someone comes in, um, someone, we do an assessment of the spine usually, uh, and we find that T4 is slightly rotated to one side. It's a, a subluxation is the old term that we use for that one, where the bone is slightly out of position, not dislocated, but just not perfectly aligned. And that the old story was that you could kind of, do a little manipulation, crack that joint, pop it back into place, put it back where it should be, and uh, you know magically the pain goes away and your function improves. 
So that's that's an old theory, right? This is something we've we've kind of having to move away from now. Yeah, that's sort of been disproven now as far as subluxations and that we're pushing something back into place with a manipulation or a mobilization because again, that instills uh, that there's structure in instability. Um, it reduces a patient's self-efficacy if they're sort of re reliant on a patient, uh, on a therapist to put something back into place for them. If I go out and exercise, I'm worried that that's just going to fall straight back out again. And, you know, I have to see that that practitioner multiple times a week. So it really creates a lot of reliance and dependence on a, on a therapist. What a great business model, though. You can get patients yeah. coming back three times a week for the rest of their lives. <laughs> it's a license to print money unethically. Is, yeah. <laughs> unethically, yeah. And I, look, the, the next question for someone who doesn't understand that or maybe is bought into the old model would be, but, you know, I have a patient comes in, they're stiff on left rotation. When I manipulate them, their movement improves, their pain gets better, and they feel like they have better control. Well, then, again, we've got to go to that. What, what's the mechanism at play? And I guess there's a couple of things there. If you manipulate a joint, if you apply grade five HVLA manipulation, you get a sudden decrease in pressure in the facet joints of the spine. So that's going to free up a joint. It's not about moving the bone back into place. It's about creating better mobility at that segment. And you can do that a thousand different ways. The other side of that is patient says, I feel like I've got better stability and control and I have less pain. Well, then when we do a, a fast manipulation of a joint, we stimulate these little mechanoreceptors called Pacinian corpuscles that respond specifically to fast intermittent forces. So not your slow, deep pressure, consistent pressure that we get with massage or those other kind of soft tissue pressures, but the things you get with a fast manipulation. And so that's, you can do that a thousand ways, um, but with the manipulation, we get this immediate feedback response back to the central nervous system, which sends... Um, signals motor control signals back out to the muscles in that area to give you better control, better feedback, better awareness, proprioception of that joint. So your somatosensory control improves and then you feel like, oh yeah, I, I, you know, I've got my movement back. That feels better. Nothing to do with moving a joint back into place, all to do with the type of force you applied, the stimulation of those specific um, sensory nerves and the feedback that your nervous system provides as a result. It's not about decompressing a nerve. It's not about moving a bone back into place. And this can be a hard um, kind of pill to swallow, I think, for the, the structural therapists out there that know, that you know, believe that they have to move everything back to perfect symmetry to get perfect health. And it's, you know, you don't have to do that. It's just not the case. Yeah, yeah and that it's, that it's all muscles that are pulling things in certain postures and, and, and positions and that that's it's a bad thing to be not in a perfect position and that's that's the link with pain you know that that can significantly influence someone's um, belief system um, and you know again back to that morphology we we don't know if they've got more antiversion through through the humerus or if their um, glenoid is more forward facing what about in their um, acetabular antiversion, you know, a range of different morphological variations that is, you know, the way that that person is. So we can't change it, but it's also if we're, we're pointing out these things, you know, and they leave feeling worse and they come in worried about, oh no, I've, I'm all out of place. They just, they said this vertebrae was twisted. My pelvis, pelvis was rotated. Um, I'm a mess. It's the worst one that they've ever seen. You know, the significant implications on on a patient's recovery and, and overall well being. So yeah, I think we really need to to consider that and and the language that we use around posture because I can guarantee that many of you listening would have patients come in and they would say, "Oh, it's because I've I've it's because of my tilt. I've I've had that for a long time, or it's because of my leg length discrepancy, or yeah." I've got a C7 rotation and that's why that's the cause of my pain. Um, it's not, that's one factor in, in, you know, the whole scheme of so many other factors. Yeah. But on, on top of that, but you've also got that long health belief. So of course, if somebody believes that it is as a result of their, um, their back being out of position or their pelvis being misaligned or whatever language they might use and they go and see someone like us and we, correct that for want of a better term they're going to feel better if that's their belief definitely and there's a, a great paper by um darlow and colleagues where they 
looked at um, patients' interpretation of, of what clinicians said, um, and they're far more likely, patients are far more likely to, to believe what healthcare practitioners say over um, what they find on the internet or from family and friends. So we can strongly influence someone's attitudes and beliefs. Mm. Uh, and if we're reinforcing that their, their pain is due to an anterior tilt or a specific tight muscle um, with that very structural approach and not considering the other factors that can be involved, well, that can, that can be a belief system that can be well ingrained in them for years and years to come, which can be a significant barrier to, to their recovery. Yeah, and I think as, as therapists, you're right in, in that we, we all want to give a diagnosis. We all want to be able to be the person that says, oh, I figured that out. You know, I, you know, you've been having this problem for so long. It's because your C7's rotated to the left. And so I'm like, oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, great. So if now that we know what it is, we can, we can fix that. And we do something and they get better for a little while, then they're worse again. And we fix them again and then they get worse again. And then pretty soon they realize that we were the only person to figure it out. And we're the only person that can make them better. It completely disempowers them. Yeah. When in fact, in actual fact, there might have been a rotation at C7, but there's every chance that it had nothing to do with the pain. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's it's hard to sort of confront our biases and be aware of them. We've, we've all got them. Um, but you'll find if you've got a strong bias towards a, a particular cause of injury, let's use that C7 again, you'll probably see a lot of C7 rotations that walk into your clinic. Um, and you, you just sort of filter the filtering them down to to fit that confirmation bias and say yeah see I knew it um, and whether it was that treatment that that helped or or not or something else um, it will still be that's that's my confirmation bias and yeah, um, exactly. that's what it was what do we say if, if all you've got is a hammer everything look starts looking like a nail exactly yeah yeah and look there's so many different ways of of skinning this cat right if someone comes into you and they've got that C7 rotation and they also happen to have lower cervical upper thoracic pain and maybe some kind of radiculopathy or something going on it's easy to say well it's the C7 you know rotation but and then we do what we do the chiropractor manipulates the physiotherapist gives the exercise the manual therapist does the massage or the taping or the stretching or the cupping or the whatever or the kinesiologist does the muscle testing and then the someone else waves some aromatherapy oils nearby them someone else polishes a crystal in the room in the corner like there's a thousand things you could do if the environment, the contextual factors, the conversation you have with the patient, um, the trust the person has in you, um, the belief system that, that, yeah, that you know what you're talking about and you are the authority, if all of that magic soup kind of comes together, you can do anything and the person will get better for a period of time. It may not be the solution for their actual cause, but they're going to get better for a little while. And, and the problem with that, of course, is, well, the good thing about that is they get better for a little while, which, you know, you can't take that away from the situation. The problem is they only get better for a little while and then they're going to come back to you because you fixed them or helped them the first time. And pretty soon they become reliant on this Band-Aid fix when I think that if we haven't resolved somebody's problem or at least move, continuously move them in, a, in an upward kind of gradient of improvement over time, um, we're not doing them justice. If we get them back to zero for four days and then they're back 10 again on the fifth day and that is the cycle, well, then we're not the answer. What we're doing is not the solution. Yeah, and, and people that have a, a poor understanding of pain tend to link the reoccurrences of pain as, as a, a re-injury to that area. Um, so, yeah, it can be, can be a tough one where we really need to spend that time educating the patient but not focusing on a single structure or pathology because when we look at, for example, imaging and we you know the high incidence of asymptomatic findings on imaging so how can we then um, if we see that structurally uh, then how can we li link a, a pelvic tilt to the course of their pain that's one one factor um, you know and if we think about um, posture it's easy to see so it's easy to link something to it but it's hard to see depression anxiety mood related disorders it's hard to ask those questions. It's hard to dig deeper. Um, so it's harder to link those to, to the cause of pain. Yeah. Let's challenge this idea again quickly before I know we're going on here, but 
the upper cross, lower cross posture is one of those things that all of us soft tissue therapists were taught from day dot, right? Mm -hmm. The upper cross example I gave you before. And someone presents with a very obvious protracted shoulder scapular position. Um, and they say, I always get tight across my upper back. And we go, well, it's because of that posture you're holding, your rhomboids or your middle traps or something in that region are getting pulled tight. They've probably got trigger points. Your pecs are shortened and tightened and it's holding you in that position. And we go and massage the pecs and activate or strengthen the rhomboids, maybe treat some trigger points and they get better. What do you think about this idea? Oh, well, find me one person in the world that doesn't think that they're tight back there. You know, they could... <laughs> They could be walking around like this and, and they're still going to have that same same understanding. Um, yeah, it's it's when we think of it like that, if you've got a sedentary person and again, sedentary behavior is, is linked with with uh, as a risk factor of, of chronic low back pain. Um, but if you've got someone that's in a sedentary environment and it's sort of to a point where the, the tissue can't cope with those demands that are being placed on it, it gets you know, increased sensitivity, um, you know, that tissue gets unhealthy essentially. So yeah, it, it may come back to a, a, a changing those positions because if you are doing any one thing for forever, yeah, you, you may not be um, sort of, uh, your body may not be happy with it, but that, that may not be the single cause because yeah. there's, yeah, when you look at the whole sedentary behavior, yeah. Um, we had a conversation a while ago about tissue capacity right, on, on, on video, yeah. um, which people can go back and watch or listen to. And I think this connects with this nicely. Yeah. So the person who sits in that crappy kind of desk posture all day long develops upper back pain because the tissue in that region hasn't developed the capacity to deal with that posture in the same way that if they were, do the other extreme, which is sitting up perfectly straight, the erector spinae, rhomboids, the middle lower traps, the muscles that would hold them there, don't have the capacity to do that if they're not used to it. So it's not necessarily the posture, it's the sustained, it's the, it's the lack of movement over longer periods of time. So if they held a poor posture, typically what we would consider a poor posture for a period of time that was acceptable to their tissues and then move to another poor posture for a period of time that was acceptable for their tissues, they're, they're not necessarily gonna have pain. And so while we point to the posture as the cause, it's more about the tissue's ability to deal with that for longer periods. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's an interesting one, like it's just changing it up rather than saying, this is your symmetry, sy symmetrical posture that you have to sit in. So yeah, well, lean off to the side for a bit, the other side, sit in a slumped position. Because if we're instilling this sort of um, symmetrical guarding posture then that can be quite a, a fearful movement if they are out of that posture oh i know i don't want to end up with back pain so i need to hold this overly protected overly guarded position and you think that the same sort of thing comes into it when we look at lifting postures and lifting mechanics and you know people do have different spinal morphologies lengths of the the spine lengths of their femurs and shape of their hips so um why don't we allow adapt the, the lifting technique for that particular person? Same goes for um, if you're sitting at, at a desk and we have a, an ergonomic workplace assessment and everything's got to be up here. Why doesn't that workplace assessment be adapted to how that person is comfortable sitting? Right. You know, rather than getting them to some, a position that they're uncomfortable in, that they're not conditioned to, they're not used to, um, get them into a comfortable position, but just educate them to, to move, we, you know, yeah. change that position up a little bit. There's no template for perfect human positioning. Yeah. So I think it's what we're saying, right? There's no, there's no textbook definition of what posture should look, look like. And this, this comes down to movement as well. We're talking about running recently. And I've, I, I think in one of our conversations, I mentioned that I've been passed by some of the most dysfunctional runners in races that I've ever seen. And I look at them, I go, what am I doing wrong? If that thing can pass me, like they're <laughs> running, they, they look like the hunchback of Notre Dame. Looks like one leg's going to snap off at any minute, but they're cruising past me. And I'm thinking I've trained for years to be able to run like this. And that guy's beating me, but they've adapted to that. You know, they may have a leg length discrepancy. They may have some kind of postural asymmetry to the spine that is causing them to hold that body position, but they're, they're cruising along. And they got they at a you know moving at a good pace and they're they're functional for them yeah. 
And so there's no textbook definition and we can all, I think, have the ability to adapt to just about anything, give it enough time and appropriate management of that thing. Yeah, but I think as far as the textbook definition, there sort of is, but it's a misconception. Like if you look at, if you type in good posture, you'll have these plumb lines and then yep. there'll be someone standing in an anatomical position who gets around walking like that? <laughs> who sits or stands or functions in anatomical position ever? Um, so if we're trying to get our patients back to anatomical perfect, it just doesn't make sense. No, no, that's right. And think of, a, of any task that is related to a job or like sport or some physical behavior that requires you to be in anatomical neutral. Yeah. There's like the Queen's guards at Buckingham Palace standing at the gate. That's probably about <laughs> as close as you get. Yeah. And they have to train for a really long time to be able to stand like that without moving. Imagine how sore they would get, how much pain they would get conditioning to that. Yep. So yeah, back to that tissue capacity, um, that would have been a, a quite a significant conditioning process for them. Mm. So, and that's anatomical perfect, which yeah. is what we're all striving for apparently, right? <laughs> Yeah, but no, this is um, screaming at the end of the day, you know. So just yeah. like anyone that would be in a, in a the same spot, but I think the point here is there's no perfect, and not everyone should be in a certain position, and that we shouldn't be labeling discrepancies as your shoulders higher, your your right um, ASIS is elevated, and you've got a posterior tilt, whatever it may be, you know, because the patient's going to walk home or drive however they get home and but they're going to talk to their partner and say oh what what they say oh they basically said that my pelvis was twisted and rotated and this was out of place and i got to get that put back in that's not what we said but that was their interpretation of it um, and that can have some some serious implications yeah yeah and then we've got to be careful about that language we use don't we about the words we use and really even at the end of the sessions ask the patient so you tell me after our conversation now, what you kind of perceive is going on. And then you've got an opportunity to correct that. You've got an opportunity to help them better interpret what you've said um, because the what the, the picture they go home with is important. Exactly. Because, yeah. you know, if we say, well, yes, I understand that, you know, your back's sore and, and that you've, you're feeling tight in this area. Um, some other factors that could, could be contributed to or, or could help would be getting some good sleep exercising, um, you know, reducing smoking, um, reducing alcohol consumption, eating a good healthy diet, uh, you know, doing some things that you enjoy, reducing your stress. All of these factors could help also reduce your, your symptoms um, and not just, you know, uh, adjusting your, your pelvic position. Mm. But that's hard work, Bo. People just want you to <laughs> crack something, push something back and, you know, you're back in place. Um, but the, you know, this is the this is the battle we have, right? We've got to we've got to be educators, not just clinicians, not just kind of the, the technicians of the application. Definitely, it, it is a you know long term process, and there is behavioural changes that that go with it, and um, you know that's why pain isn't easy. If 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 pain was easy to treat, then we'd probably all be out of a job. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's um let's sum up a couple of things here before we finish the key things because we we don't want people just like we've said we don't want our patients to go home with the wrong perception, we don't want the listeners to go home thinking we've said one thing and not another, and so the key things for me stand out that are um, when we have moments in time where we our tissues get overloaded because of a an asymmetrical posture or a position we've held that's not you know anatomical not biomechanically efficient. For example, the phone on the shoulder with you holding with your ear, sitting in an awkward position because you've got a wallet in the back pocket. Something's happened that's put you in a position that you haven't adapted well to, and then you get pain as a result of that thing. Now, if we say that that's postural cause, that's probably fair to say because there's been a moment in time that's been connected with the, the symptoms. What we're also saying in the same breath is that if somebody presents with pain and then we go looking for posture that they're also presenting with in that, in that day, on that day, we can't necessarily connect those two things because we also don't know how long they've had that posture for. All we know is how long they've had the pain for. Yeah, yeah that's right. There's no causal relationship with, with posture and, and pain. Um, so, yeah, I think instilling beliefs around 
posture as the cause of their pain um, isn't supported by evidence. Uh, so we, we should be reframing from, from doing that. Um, you know, and just, yeah, encouraging different positions, different postures, different movements, um, reducing the, the, the fear in, in someone who does present with back, back pain and it's worried that a certain posture will, will make it worse. And if they can't get out of that posture, then they get frustrated and, you know, that, that pain cycle continues. Then, and then the patients, of course, that come and say, well, when my back is out, and I go to the therapist and they crack my back and it feels better. They've obviously put the thing back where it's meant to be. And, you know, like we've explained before, that's not necessarily the case. The bone might shift a little bit, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with their reduction in pain. There's all this sensory input that the treatment's applied and it doesn't have to be an adjustment that can produce that. It can be, you know, we apply kinesiology tape, which just gently lifts the tissue, creates a decompression of the nociceptors and a whole bunch of other proprioceptive input. That can be enough to change the person's perception of that region of the body and improve muscular control and coordination and reduction in pain like there's you know 100 ways to skin a cat is what we're saying and it doesn't have to be put a bone back to get rid of the pain in fact that idea as we said earlier is is now so outdated it's not even funny yeah definitely there's there's, there's a lot to it and I, I guess we could go on for a long period of time but um yeah i mean i know i certainly learned very mechanical postural base um, cause of pain and I think you know the more that I understand about it now and and you know the uh, the literature that comes out you know moving away from those old ideas with a more of a, a modern pain sites uh, approach I think that's really, really quite important um, and I'll I'll put a um, blog out about this topic as well with some references if, right. if anyone wants to go and read it yeah no, that'd be good all right we will leave it there then. Thank you, Bo. That was great. Hopefully everyone's taken away a couple of ideas, maybe challenged some old ideas. And if, you know, if this fits, if the, if the postural kind of concept fits in your bias, and that's not necessarily a judgment, that's just a, a statement of facts. We all have a bias. Um, hopefully this conversation is just to challenge you to think a little bit differently about it, maybe consider some different angles um, because there's so much more to it than just how the body is held in space. Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Bo. Talk Thank you. Soon. Bye. Cheers.